Mr. Deputy Speaker. Order. Item 3, Employment Amendment Bill, second reading. Minister for Manpower. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. Sir, the Employment Act or EA is Singapore's main <coughs> employment law. It provides for the basic terms and working conditions for employees while meeting employers' needs to stay competitive. Since it was last reviewed in 2012, the profile of our labour force and local employment practices have continued to evolve. A review is therefore timely to ensure that the EA remains relevant. My ministry, together with our tripartite partners, the National Trades Union Congress, or NTUC, and the Singapore National Employers Federation, or SNEF, carried out extensive consultations. The result is a set of substantive amendments that meet the interests of both employees and employers. Members may be aware that the EA was first enacted in 1968 by then Minister for Foreign Affairs and Labour, S. Raja Ratnam. It has come a long way. Back then, managers and executives were a very small part of our workforce. There was little need to cover them under the EA. It was more than 40 years later that we started covering some managers and executives in 2009. We have also enhanced employment protection and benefits over the years. For example, we introduced childcare leave and enhanced maternity leave in 2004. In 2009, we extended the provisions on compensation for work on public holidays and paid sick leave to all employees under the EA. Recently, in 2016, we also introduced itemized payslips and written key employment terms. Each amendment of the EA is a result of careful consideration by the tripartite partners to meet the interests of both employers and employees. As we mark the 50th anniversary of the EA this year, we should acknowledge the tripartite collaboration that has kept our EA relevant and well calibrated. Let me provide an overview of the amendments in this bill, which is intended to take effect on 1st April 2019. It covers changes in three key areas. First, we will extend core provisions of the EA to cover all managers and executives. This will mean that other than domestic workers, public officers and seafarers who will continue to be covered by other acts and regulations due to the nature of their work, all employees will enjoy the protection of the EA. Second, we will extend additional protection under Part 4 of the Act to cover more employees. Third, we will enhance our employment dispute resolution framework. Let me elaborate on the key amendments. The first set of amendments extends the core provisions under the EA to all employees. These include the minimum days of annual leave, paid public holiday, and sick leave entitlements, as well as other protections, such as timely payment of salary and protection against wrongful dismissal. Today, three groups of employees already enjoy core provisions. First, all workmen. These are our manual workers or blue-collar workers. Second, all non-workmen, and these are our rank-and-file white-collar workers. Third, managers and executives with basic monthly salaries up to $4,500. With the proportion of PMETs rising and expected to make up two-thirds of our local workforce by 2030, it is timely to make a more fundamental change to the coverage of the EA. In consultation with the tripartite partners, we will remove the $4,500 salary threshold for managers and executives. In doing so, 
all employees, whether managers and executives, workmen or non-workmen, will be covered by core provisions under the EA. This will benefit an additional 430,000 managers and executives. In addition to the core provisions, the EA provides a set of additional protections in Part 4, such as on hours of work, rest day and overtime pay. Today, Part 4 covers workmen earning up to $4,500 and non-workmen earning up to $2,500. They are collectively known as Part 4 employees. In consultation with the tripartite partners, we will increase the salary threshold for non-workmen from $2,500 to $2,600, bringing Part 4 employees to half of our total workforce. In addition, we will align the salary cap of $2,250 for calculating overtime pay with the new salary threshold of $2,600. Taken together, an additional 100,000 employees will benefit from these enhancements. As we amend the EA to benefit more employees, we have also introduced changes to better meet business requirements. For example, currently, when workmen and non-workmen are required to work on public holidays, employers have only two options. They can compensate with an extra day's pay or provide a full day off in lieu. We will introduce a third option for workmen and non-workmen who are not Part 4 employees. Employers will be able to grant them time off for the hours worked on a public holiday rather than a full day off. With this change, the options for non-Part 4 workmen and non-workmen would be the same as that for managers and executives. With these changes, all employees will continue to be compensated for working on public holidays. Employers will be able to grant time off to all non-Part 4 employees. Part 4 employees who have lower bargaining power will continue to receive either an extra day's pay or a full day off if they are required to work on a public holiday. Another improvement for businesses has to do with authorised deductions. Today, the EA limits the type of salary deductions that employers can make, such as absence from work or damaging or losing goods entrusted to the employee. Such controls protect the employee's interests, but can also inconvenience them. For example, some companies provide voluntary group hospital and surgical insurance for their employees if the employees agree to co-pay the premiums. The EA currently does not allow such deductions even when the employees agree. So employees have to separately reimburse the employer. The EA will be amended to allow a deduction if it fulfills two conditions. Firstly, the employee must willingly consent to the deduction in writing. Secondly, the employee must be able to withdraw his consent at any time without any penalty. This less prescriptive approach would allow employers and employees greater flexibility to arrange for mutually agreed deductions. At the same time, employees' interests continue to be protected. In addition, Deductions still cannot constitute more than 50% of the employee's total salary for any one salary period. Deductions for amenities and services supplied by the employer will continue to require the Commissioner's approval. The third set of amendments enhances our employment dispute resolution framework. Currently, Salary-related disputes are adjudicated by the Employment Claims Tribunal, or ECT, while wrongful dismissal claims are adjudicated by MOM. In fact, both types of disputes are often related. <coughs> to provide both employees and employers with a more convenient one-stop service, we will shift the adjudication of wrongful dismissal claims from MOM to the ECT. 
In line with this one-stop service approach, we will also expand the coverage of the tripartite mediation framework to include wrongful dismissal claims. Over the years, a considerable body of cases involving wrongful dismissal claims have been accumulated. They put into practice the broad principles used by MOM that also reflect the consensus reached between employers and unions. The type of dismissal cases that MOM hears include not only those when the employee was terminated by the employer, but also cases where the employee resigned involuntarily. Involuntary res resignation can be considered wrongful dismissal if the employee was forced to do so for wrongful reasons. For example, an employer may make work conditions unreasonably difficult to force the employee to resign so as to deprive him of his employment benefits and to mask the employer's wrongful behaviour. The wrongful dismissal cases heard by MOM have not been published thus far as there was little need to do so. With the transfer of the adjudication function to the ECT, MOM will publish a set of tripartite guidelines on wrongful dismissal. These tripartite guidelines will contain illustrations of what constitutes wrongful dismissal and what does not. Under the Employment Claims Act, when the ECT adjudicates a case, it must take into account the principles and parameters contained in the tripartite guidelines. In cases where a dismissal is found to be wrongful, the ECT will order compensation or reinstatement. There is no change to the scope of remedies. Per the current practice, the ECT will take into account factors beyond just the wages or maternity benefits owed to the employee in determining the amount of compensation. So when the EA was first expanded in 2009 to cover managers and executives, the tripartite partners agreed that MNEs, managers and executives, would only be eligible to claim for wrongful dismissal if they have served for at least 12 months. Following further tripartite discussion, employers have agreed to reduce this qualifying period to six months on the basis that it would be sufficient for them to assess an MNE's suitability for the job. This is in recognition that performance in an MNE role is not so immediately clear compared to workmen or non-workmen where there is no qualifying period. This is a win-win approach as forcing employers to accept an even shorter period would make them more hesitant in offering employment to candidates they are not entirely sure of. Finally, we will also make other amendments to the EA to enhance its flexibility and ensure it remains responsive. Today, employers are required under the EA to accord paid sick leave only if the medical certificate is issued by the government and the company appointed doctors. This provision has been in place since the EA was first enacted in 1968. As the minister back then made clear, there were frequent absences using fictitious MCs. Government stepped in then to specify which doctor's MCs would be recognised by law. Today, doctors are registered under the Medical Registration Act and are subject to the Singapore Medical Council Ethical Code and Ethical Guidelines. Therefore, there is no longer a need to distinguish between MCs issued by different groups of doctors where paid sick leave is concerned. Moving ahead, we will require employers to recognise MCs from all registered doctors for the purpose of granting sick leave. Given this widening in the recognition of MCs, it is timely to also clarify what hospitalisation entails under the EA. The clauses on hospitalisation have been in place since 1968 and the intent has been for hospitalisation leave to cover the period requiring hospital care. However, certain ground practices have deviated from the policy intent over the years. Today, 
some non-hospital doctors may issue medical certificates for hospitalization leave for conditions that do not require any hospitalization, such as sprains. To clarify the intent, we will specify in the EA that when it comes to hospitalization leave, employers are required to recognize medical certificates only if they are issued by hospital doctors. Employers who wish to recognize MCs from their own panel doctors for granting hospitalization leave are free to continue to do so. Hospitalization leave will continue to cover inpatient stays in hospitals and day surgeries. In addition, the post-discharge period of rest, all further medical treatment for the condition that the employee was hospitalized for will also be covered. There are also certain circumstances where we will continue to require employers to recognize MCs for purposes of hospitalization leave. Occasionally, the hospital doctor assesses that inpatient stay or day surgery is required, but for some reason, that does not happen. For example, a hospital doctor may assess that a pregnant woman requires hospitalization for bed rest due to complications in pregnancy, but she may prefer to rest at home. There may also be other specific circumstances, such as quarantine orders as required by law, which would qualify employees for hospitalization leave. We will provide for these situations in the Act and regulations. So there is also a need to enhance MOM's regulatory framework to ensure that it remains responsive to the emergence of undesirable employment practices. For example, some employers have out of convenience or even an intention to cover up for late or non-payment of salaries, ask their employees to sign salary vouchers before receiving their salaries or to sign on blank salary vouchers. Such errant practices should be curbed. The worker may not realize that salary vouchers can be used as proof of receipt of payment in cases of dispute. We will therefore provide in the EA that the Minister for Manpower can make regulations to protect employees from any employment practice that may adversely affect their well-being, including where the enforcement of their entitlements might be at risk. For a start, we intend to make it a civil contravention for employers to ask an employee to indicate receipt of salary before he is paid or sign a receipt that is blank or inaccurate. Sir, we have covered many changes in this bill. With your permission, may I ask the clerk to distribute a handout on the key changes to the Employment Act for yes, ease of members' reference. Sir, please allow me to summarize the bill in Mandarin. Yizang先生, 同时展望未来专业人士经理执行人员与技师可以受到法律的保障 
，经过磋商后，认为月入超过四千五百元的经理和执行人员，其实也应该享有这些基本的保障。大约三四十三万名经理和执行人员，将能因此受惠。我们也将调整非劳动、非劳力工人的薪金顶线，以让更多员工在工作时间、加班费和休息日等方面获得更全面的法律保障。大约十万名工人将能因此受惠。此外，为了让雇员和雇主更方便地解决劳资纠纷，我们也会简化。解决劳资纠纷的程序。总的来说，这次的修正案是积极和全面的。如果获得通过，雇佣法令的涵盖范围将扩大，除了保护收入较高的经理和执行人员，还能为更多雇员带来额外的保障。总受惠人士超过五十万人。与此同时，雇主。在人力资源管理上，也能享受更多的灵活度，有助于打造更开明的职场。Sir, in conclusion, this bill will better protect our workers, enhance our dispute resolution framework, and provide employers enhanced flexibility. It will bolster our efforts to institute good employment norms and develop progressive workplaces for our people. Sir, I beg to move.